Following the two-hour return trip from Abydos, I skipped dinner, showered, and crashed out early. The ship cruised back up the Nile and once again made port at Luxor. We had the morning of day seven off, so it was breakfast, nap, lunch, then an afternoon at Karnak. Construction at the complex began in the Middle Kingdom and continued into the Ptolemaic period. However, most of the surviving structures date to the New Kingdom. Approximately 30 pharaohs contributed to the buildings. The complex is vast. In just the portion open to the public, there are no fewer than 10 pylons, all separated by courts and halls. I could spend days here, but we had about three hours. It's predominantly sandstone, but there are also granite obelisks and statues, as well as the reconstructed Red Chapel of Hatshepsut, which contains granite, diorite, and quartzite. From old photos, we can see that as with Luxor, this site had also been taken over by the sand. This was the hottest day of the trip at 99 degrees. The sun was directly overhead and it was brutal. Frozen water bottles turned hot within 10 minutes. Approaching the first pylon on the west side, we cross what looks like an ancient canal, but considering the proximity of the Nile, it may have been the riverbank. The top of the gateway, as well as the top of the pylon, is missing, but we do see the familiar vertical flag slots and square openings. A total of eight, which is the most we've seen to date. Leading up to the entrance is an avenue of ram-headed sphinxes, and this one is not like the others. Is that a carved slot? It's details like this which make me wonder if some of the statues we see are modern recreations, which have been cast. In the first open court we have a building and colonnade on the left, more sphinxes and a colonnade on the right. The second pylon and gateway are obliterated, and not much is left of the colonnade leading up to it. In the foreground is a small offering table with the crown and corner bead detail. A little further back is a large block of alabaster. Check out that veining. Then a backside view of the first pylon. I'm unsure of the reason for the mud brick stack behind it. The guides directed us to the side temple of Ramses II. The open court was lined with the Osiris-style colonnade, and again I find these random hollows to be peculiar. At the back we have a series of chapels. They are covered in high and low relief carvings, have incorporated crown detail, and substantial ceiling damage, which has been reinforced with metal fasteners. I'm not sure if these window grates are part of the carved block, or if it's a multi-piece mortar job. Then of course, the room with the enticing staircase, blocked off. The middle section is a hypostyle hall, closed reed columns, low relief carvings, a lot of mortar repair, and extensive ceiling block anchoring. Back in the open court, we see that out of the 10 giant columns, only one remains standing among the other nubs. Here's a side exit, and then I'm not sure if this is part of the pylon or a separate structure, but it had two odd-shaped entrance points. The one in the middle turned to the right once inside and disappeared into the darkness. It wasn't blocked off, and there were no signs saying I couldn't go in there, but I didn't chance it. Passing through the second pylon, we enter into what is probably the most recognized aspect of Karnak, the hypostyle hall in the precinct of Amun-Ra. Its area is around 50,000 square feet, with 134 massive columns arranged into 16 rows. The 12 largest are 70 to 80 feet in height, with a diameter close to 10 feet. The remaining 122 are 30 to 35 feet in height. The extensive damage is from floodwaters. The sandstone absorbs the water, salt crystallizes in the pores, and it breaks up the stone, like leaving a can of soda in the freezer. All of the fill is limestone mortar, which is an attempt to halt further decay. Obligatory shot of the eroded polygonal floor. This is where we wandered through a hole in the wall and found ourselves on the side of the temple. Meandering through a large field of random stones until we reconvened with the group somewhere in this area. Here we found fluted columns with square notches, wall niches with hinge pockets for flush mounted double doors, this odd block, and then a curious staircase. The guardian would motion for you to go up, follow, and then essentially corner you while asking for money. The area also has a few black granite statues, this one being of Sekhmet. Fragments of obelisks can be found scattered throughout the complex, but these two stand between the third and fifth pylon. They are single-piece granite and have a crisp and deep row of low-relief hieroglyphs running down the center of each face. 
it appears that shallower inscriptions were being added to the empty space on either side, but that's just speculation on my part. This mystical green door stirred up some debate. The guide said it was made of a single block of unique stone from a yet unknown quarry, which sounded pretty fantastical. Closer inspection had me convinced that this is actually modern concrete, and whoever was blending the edge didn't even clean up their splatter. Once multiple people started questioning the guide, the story changed to, this is a recreation and the original has been moved to a museum. Which museum, you ask? They never answered that question. Moving into the north-south axis, we find the top of an obelisk. This is said to ring like a bell when struck, but it's roped off and a guardian was on watch, so we never got the opportunity to test the claim. The area opens up to the sacred lake, which I believe is man-made. The perimeter wall is made from blocks, and it has multiple staircases leading down to the water. Old photos show that it was filled in with sand over time, unless the squared walls are modern beautification for tourism. This is a stone sculpture of a scarab, and a better picture of it from the internet. At this point, we headed towards the construction zone, the pylons in this area are being rebuilt using modern cranes. Looks like a combination of a tower crane and a beam crane. Past this large pylon is the Avenue of Sphinxes which connects to Luxor Temple. A big pile of debris was being burned, and then I guess it was selfie time. This pylon is partially rebuilt, retains the corner bead detail, and is riddled with square notches. There's part of a standing figure on the right and three colossi on the left. This one is especially interesting. As we got closer, something about the pedestal caught my eye. What is up with this? A polygonal stone plug, partial anyway, and voids in the stone. Was someone just digging into this statue? It doesn't look like a modern cast. Based on the carvings, the plug isn't even the original stone, just somewhat shaped to fit. This is the set of legs on the right. Single piece granite and high quality carving. As we make our way back to the east-west axis, we pass another wall niche with inset double doors. I really wish some of these doors remained. A section of smaller columns built from multiple blocks per course, instead of the usual layered slice construction, then holes and a recess cut into wall block for what I assume would be a sliding door lock. Heading deeper on the main axis, we find another chapel with an offering table and a curious staircase. It's small, kinda goes nowhere, but it's part of the larger stone, which is impressive. I don't really know where we are at this point, but it's in this general vicinity. Behind this chapel is another open court, and then the Temple of Tutmosis III. On the way there was a spare parts bin with column chunks and a stone wheel. The exterior is quite weathered, while the interior has retained a surprising amount of pigment. The back half of this temple is pretty ruinous, with small sections of columns still standing and blocks haphazardly strewn about. This block with half columns carved into the face was pretty interesting. And this is where I fell off the map. Our entire group had turned around, but how could I resist a wooden ramp, no blockade, and no guardians? This is a pretty isolated area, but the ramp led to a set of stairs, more ruins, and this thing. It kind of looks like the guardians have been building the kids' playset during lunch break. If this is actually an ancient structure, I'd love to know what it is. The gravel path weaved to the right, past a mud brick wall on the left, towards a small colonnade, and what was probably once the easternmost pylon. I could have pressed on, but I was getting that odd feeling of possibly ending up hogtied in a van, so I pulled a 180 and double-timed it back. On our way out and back to the bus, as one of the few stragglers, I got a few more pictures of the standing obelisk as well as the large alabaster block. 